So welcome to another video from theplayersaid.com. My name's Alexander, and today we're doing something uh, a little different. I don't normally do these kinds of instructional style videos, but our review that we did of this game was already long, and it would have been very long if I'd have included anything like this showing the board and how it functions. So I thought I'd do it separately, and maybe a bit more thoroughly, so hopefully you can get a better gauge for the flow of the game and what it's like. Um, so this is the setup for the 1710 scenario. Um, basically the way the game works is that you are a family uh, and you have a little player board that tells you some useful bits and pieces. The chances of success based on how many dice you're rolling is important, although when I play it's negligible because I will always roll down here and no one cares. Um, and there's a tiny little chart here with whichever family action you're going to take. You put a glass bead on it so that next time you take that action, if you do the same one, you get to do it twice. But normally you just kind of move around doing different ones on there. And you have this big old pool uh, of, uh, of family members. They're all the same. Uh, they just have different pictures on them. Uh, but these are the pink ones here. And the last thing that you'll have is you'll have this little hand of five promissory notes. If you've played TI4, you know what those are. Uh, and so this is like, take two pounds or less from me later on, or take my office holders bonus, which we'll get there. V vote with my enterprises as if you owned them. Um, take my London season card from the display, or my consent for nepotism. So you have five of those, those are bartering chips. Everything is up for grabs in this game, and everything can be bartered, basically. Um, there is a deck of these um, uh, office holder cards which will get dealt out in the final step of setup which we'll go through. Um, this is the London season card and display. Normally you set these up last because someone might be taking some of these blackmail cards out of there. I just set it up because I'm not playing a real game, it doesn't really matter. Um, but the board is divided up into these little holding boxes which have victory point markers on them. One thing about this game, this little kind of rhombus shape is a, uh, is a victory point, but the circular shape, like we've got here on the, on the Prime Minister, this circular one with a number, that is a power point. Those are two different things. <laughs> the, the rhombus, straight victory points, the power might lead to victory points depending on if you have enough. And there is the world's tiniest matrix up here, printed so small no one can see it, um, where you have um, where you have how the power translates into points. Uh, um, which, you know, one or two people might score depending on when the game ends uh, and how much power has been distributed. So that is, uh, that, that's that part of it. Uh, so you're trying, the, the whole point of the game, generally speaking, is to accrue victory points on this victory point track. You're going to do that primarily from retiring your office holders and paying for them to have nice stately homes so they can be rich and be prestigious. You might also pick up some victory points from these London season cards. Uh, this is going out, getting married, getting dresses, diversifying your portfolio. You can only do this if you retire in style with lots of money to spend in London. Um, again, the real only other way to get victory points is um, you can pick up a couple um, from power. Um, the other way is with the buying luxury goods. Buying luxury goods gives you two points apiece. They cost four dollars or four pounds and they are extremely expensive and don't do anything for you throughout the game, generally speaking. Um, you can also get victory points from an invested workshop. Uh, so we, we have this, this workshop here, you have to pay five pounds to get one. They do give you uh, a pound, but you only get the one victory point from this if the company fails. Um, so there's two ways that this game is going to end. The game's either going to end at the end of the designated number of rounds, uh, at which point the company has succeeded and it was f uh, afloat the whole time. If the company standing tanks and the company goes under, you get this big old F here and the company is done with. It was so unprofitable, it was a disaster, waste of money, um, that all your shareholders, who would normally get one point per share, will now lose a point per share. That's right, you can have negative victory points and you see it regularly. Um, 
But if if the company fails and you had um, divested your portfolio and you've got workshops and all that kind of stuff, you now get points for having you know money elsewhere and not just in the company. Um, and then I think the other way to get victory points, which I just looked at, was um, I'm sure there's more ways. There's you you pick them up here and there, right? I think that's that's what we're doing with that though. Uh, but the company starts kind of here and you have time, if you can see it sinking, to kind of try and right the ship or to do really well. That gives you a bit more leeway if things do go awry. Um, we have a couple decks of cards up here. Uh, this is the company failure deck. If the company does go under, you draw one of these randomly and it's like, lose victory point. Do, you don't score workshops. So all those workshops that you had invested in don't score. <laughs> or lower each player's VPs for each one of their shipyards that they have. It's just a, an extra random punitive thing if the company goes under, where if you were trying to purposefully sink the company, it could blow up in your face. It might not, but it could. Um, so that's, that's those. This is a deck of um, law cards. Um, so you are, if, the, if you're the prime minister during the parliament phase, we're going to go through those uh, later on but laws will get enacted over the course of the game, will change the rules of the game. Um, the, most of this is holding boxes. Uh, what you have here are these holding boxes for the three different armies. You have the army of Bombay, of Madras, and Bengal, and those correspond to the presidency of Bombay, Madras, and Bengal. Uh, and we've got this map of India that's quite abstract. Uh, it's a very high level. But generally speaking, the armies and the presidencies uh, represent, so Bengal up here, Madras down here, and Bombay over here, that's where the ports are. So this port, oh, this this one here, sorry. No, that doesn't go there. Where does that go? I set it up wrong. Ignore me for that bit. Yeah, it goes down here. Okay, that's where that goes. Um, these areas that kind of cross over into the sea, this is a port, this is a port, and this is a port, they also have a darker border around them. Um, this is where kind of our influence on the continent starts and we have to travel inwards into the continent along these roads to do more trades or to launch our military attacks if that's what we want to do. Uh, so these are holding boxes for our military assets and this is a general map. Uh, so the map is divided up into these regions. The regions are color coded um, as well, which is helpful. Lots of things play off of that. Um, but you have these towers, and these represent local um, strength. So here we have, this is one strength, because it has one layer plus a little lid, just for fun. The lid itself is just a zero. It just shows that this is under control of this. Um, you can't have nothing there, you just have a little lid, even though there's no military strength here. You'll notice that these three have a matching copper flag on them. This is a small little flag. This is a big flag with a little star on it. That tells you that these with the matching flags are all under one kind of confederacy. It's one uh, larger nation uh, of these three. The large flag is the capital of that nation. Um, these little spots are trade spots. Some of them are closed. We will have to open those to open up trade with trade relations and things like that later on. Each of these um, regions also has uh, this little loot token where if you do a military conquest there, this is how much additional loot you can get. Some of them are sevens or sixes, eights. Very, very lucrative um, if that's the way that you want to go, but that's kind of a one-time bonus. And the last thing that we've got here on the continent is the elephant. And the elephant uh, is kind of a crisis marker. And it points in the direction that its nose is going. If you look at it at the top, it's kind of pointy at the nose end. And it starts the game pointed, in, in the 1710 scenario, it starts pointing from Maratha into Delhi. And what that represents is, is that Maratha is attempting to break away from and rebel against the capital of Delhi. They've got two military strength, these guys have only got one, they're feeling a bit big in their britches, and they're going to go and try to break away from Delhi and become independent. That's really what that represents. <laughs> Very abstract in the game, but that's that's kind of what that is. Um, 
And generally speaking, that is all of the board assets. Um, a couple of notes on setup. So this is kind of just like generally putting it all out. Oh, each of these holding boxes that has the coin symbol, e.g. not this one, starts with three gold or three pounds in it. Uh, on the prime minister dial, which will be given out later, I could not find it anywhere in the rules. It is very, very, very uh, small. The prime minister's arm, which points to kind of the starting policy, starts on the 1710, which is very, very, very small on power. So it's, he starts pointing there. If you're doing 1758, it's over here, 1813, down here. So just, I couldn't find a rule for that anywhere. It's printed on there, so don't spend ages looking for that like I did. Um, if we're playing a six player game, which you want to try and do, um, you start off with all of these different little starting cards, which will be dealt out, and you're going to add to them all of these extra ones, and you're going to shuffle them all up, and you can either um, deal out three to everyone and draft them, or you can just straight deal them. If I'm playing with new players, I'll just kind of deal them because... Drafting games are tough for new players because there's so much in this game, it's hard to assess what to keep and what, what not to. So if it's your first of a game, just deal them out, problem solved. Everyone's gonna have three of these um, and they will give you things like the, uh, the officership of the military affairs. So little pink guy, he gets it, he's gonna become the officer of military affairs. He's also gonna get a shipyard. So you get a little shipyard and it has a name Fortitude with a corresponding ship. Let's see if I can't find it. Hey, there it is, the corresponding ship that sits on there if it's unbuilt. However, this one says you place the ship in East Indian Ocean. So we place it in the E, East Indian Ocean. That's where that starts. And I start with one pound from this card. So I take one pound, I put it on my family treasury. And you're gonna have three of these. So you might also be the president of Bengal. You might also have, this is a, the symbol for a share in a company. A share in a company is represented by a person on the court of directors. I might also be the prime minister and I might also have a random blackmail card, which is why you don't typically set these up, but again, we're not playing a game, so it doesn't really matter. But you're gonna have three of those. Um, some of them will provide you with lots and lots of money, or you might be a president of Bombay, you might have lots of money, you might have you might start with a luxury good, which means you start with victory points. Um, you might start with lots of guys in the army uh, down here so that they can go out and fight. You might start with two extra shipyards, but they're both unfitted, so they both have the ship on here, but they can be built. Uh, so I'm going to deal these out and kind of set up that part of it um, just so that we can see that, and then we'll kind of go through what a teacher of the game looks like. So it's quite it's quite messy, and you can't see uh, some of this stuff just because the board's quite big and unwieldy to get on camera. But uh, basically, everyone's been assigned their uh, kind of bits and pieces. What you'll notice on the board is that you have all of these different player pieces, uh, which are nice and brightly colored. We also added a few of these ships as well that started out, and we have our bunch of army commanders as well. So uh, pink is our chairman of the company, which holds a lot of power. They also have three shares in the company. Uh, yellow, blue, and gray have one share in the company. What that really means is that pink is massively invested into this company. Um, so just be bear that in mind. They'll lose three victory points if the company were to go under and this looks like this. Or four because the chairman also counts as a share. Not great. Um, <laughs> but they also were the manager of shipping and they were also the presidency of Bengal. So they have a lot of power in this. So that's maybe something to kind of be aware of, be careful of. Uh, Green ended up with a couple of writers. Um, the writers are here will go out to get commission for trades, but they're also candidates for the next presidency if the president retires. So having writers out is important. It's a, neat, a nice, easy way to get money. They're also the army leader of Bengal and the commander of the army of Bombay as well. Um, Blue ended up with the Director of Trade with the Share, Presidency of Madras. They also ended up with a lot of money, um, which is, you know, they might not be the strongest position on the board, but money can get you a lot of places, and they ended up with a shipyard. Uh, oh, Blue didn't end up with much money. They, had, they started with a luxury good, which is worth two victory points. So Blue starts with two victory points. Hey, can't go wrong with victory points. Uh, yellow has a share and not a whole lot else but they are the prime minister, which is strong. 
They had two blackmail cards, which we'll take a look at, and six money, which is a lot of money, honestly, uh, to start with. So the blackmail cards, are, they have two functions. First, they have really nasty little cards. So play any time on a turn before the family phase to swap two adjacent power markers. You know, that's the only thing I don't have on the board which I need to set up. That's pretty funny. So we are going to put those out. Uh, shares, start here. Uh, social, or luxury goods, social. Shipping and manufacturing. So this is the family phase. So before the family phase, you can switch up the position of these. Every luxury good at the end of the game is worth two power. And again, power translates into some victory points. So you could bump this one up and this one down. So if anyone's got a bunch of luxury goods, they're worth less power. Um, but now you've empowered the board of directors to get a lot of power and have a lot of victory points at the end of the game. Or you can say, so the shareholders, we're gonna move up the shipping because I have lots of ships and this is worth zero now and the ships are all worth one power, which again, power translates into victory points not at a one-to-one -one ratio, though. So it gives you the ability to kind of mess with some things, um, but they also provide you with power as well, right? It's power that you wield over people. So this player has four, two from each of those cards, and two from holding the prime ministership. That's four power to start with, which is a very strong position to pick up those extra VPs at the end of the game. Will they hold on to all that? Probably not. But, it, you know, you can do it. Uh, we went through pink, uh, purple is the uh, the officer of military affairs and not much else but uh, just off camera what you can't see is is that they have three ships two unbuilt and one of them on the board the thistleworth so three ships each ship if it's built gives you one pound during the um, revenue or during the bonus phase but it also provides you with a vote to vote during the parliament phase so they have three votes which is really nice a bunch of money and a blackmail card as well uh, and then gray up here, they have six money, and gray ended up with a lot of um, junior officers who will go into the armies to provide military bonuses. The presidency of Bombay, and a writer in Madras as well, as well as a share. So that's kind of how that all looks uh, at the beginning of the game. So what you do is you just go round the ribbon of the game. So you see this big red ribbon, you're gonna go through it all and you're gonna do each different phase. Um, the last thing that we're gonna do, now that we've assigned all of these and put these writers out, each of these different offices has a, a respective card and you give the card to the owner of that office. So the chairman, which is pink, gets the pink card and they flip it over and it tells you what you do when it's the chairman's phase. It's real simple like that. So we've got director of trade is blue, manager of shipping is pink. Pink has an unconscionable amount of power in this game. Military affairs is purple. President of Bombay is gray. President of Madras is blue. And president of Bengal is also pink. Good gracious, that's a lot of power. Um, there will be opportunities for more offices to open. Um, perhaps governorships, perhaps a governor general if that law gets passed, uh, a superintendent of um, trade to China if that gets opened. Uh, so there's lots of other things that can happen in the game. But basically, we're going to go through, we start with the family phase, and we're going to go around this ribbon and just do all the things. So the first thing we do is f the family phase, family actions and company shares. So what you're going to do is each player, starting with the chairman and then going left, yeah, so the chairman's right here to get a little chairman card just to remember, hey, you're the chairman. Remember, you're the chairman. And you break all the ties and do all the stuff. They are going to literally read the chairman card and do what it says. So they may take debt up to the track. Taking more than three requires the court's approval. So what they're going to do is they are going to take out debt. And the company starts with 10 gold. 10 pounds, that's where it starts. We always forget about that. Um, for each point of debt that you incur, you get five pounds in a treasury. So they can take up to three, which gets you to 25 without asking anyone. If they want to take out more, and you can take out as much as you want, they would need approval from the board of directors. Well, 
Pink has uh, a massive power in the court of directors. So they only need one person to agree with them uh, and they could take out more debt if they wanted. Um, typically you see three, because 25 is a lot of money. Uh, and we don't, we, don't want to, we don't necessarily start fighting right out of the gate. So you're gonna get 25 pounds and you get the cash for that. This goes down to zero. And then you're gonna allocate this money into these kind of holding boxes that the re respective officers will then spend to take actions. Uh, so the director of trade, everything starts with three pounds and 70 10, but you're gonna apportion this out. We're gonna put a bunch out into the presidency so that we can do some stuff. We're gonna put some more into the shipping so we can buy some more um, boats. And then we are gonna go really hard and put a bunch of money into like, let's say um, we'll go into Bengal and we're gonna try to launch some big military attacks there. We need money to do that. Now, all this is up for negotiation. The presidency of Bombay may be like, hey man, I want that money to launch a military campaign because I command the army of Bombay and I'll get more loot from it. What can I do, Mr. Chairman, to get you to put that five pounds instead of in Bengal into Bombay? Well, might give some money, might give a promissory note, might be able to talk it out, that kind of a thing. Everything's up for grabs and there'll be offers and counter offers and all that kind of stuff. But the chairman is basically gonna incur debt and allocate that money. Uh, and it counts as a share as well. So I think they don't even need to ask because they have four, so they don't need to ask permission. But that's, again, wildly strong. Um, so that's, that's what we're doing there with the chairman. Um, I skipped the family phase. I don't know why I did that. <laughs> so the family phase is where you're starting with the chairman. You choose one of these actions to do on your little card. So you have this, these little six actions. You can either enlist a writer, which is literally put one of your guys into one of these boxes in Bombay, Madras, or Bengal, and then they'll be eligible to be put out to fulfill orders, or they'll be eligible to go in line to the presidency, depending on how much you can bribe your way in there. So you can enlist a writer. You can buy a shipyard if you've got money. You buy a shipyard, and you get this. Again, it needs to be built by the manager of shipping. You could buy a workshop, which are good for votes and are good for um, potential income and things like that. You could enlist an officer. If you want to put an officer in here that they could go and fight, you could get more loot that way. You could seek a share in the company. Um, early game, in the first round, you typically don't do that because what this does is once we have incurred debt, so this happens before there's any debt, you can pay for a share, I'm gonna pay four pounds, get rid of four pounds, and you reduce the debt of the company by buying a share. And what that means is we can take out more debt and then I become a shareholder. So it's, it can be very strong, it can be very expensive, but it can be very strong. Um, or you can buy a luxury. And again, the luxury is just buying victory points with your money, it's okay, but it's, it kind of gums up what you're doing, you're just taking money out of the game basically. So there's the family phase, we're all gonna go around doing that. Um, you will buy a lot of writers typically, because writers can be very good. Buy some writers. And we will then put out an officer, and maybe someone buys a ship, and then Gray's gonna, I don't know. Um, they'll, they'll, they're gonna go into Madras, sure, why not? So family phase is just kind of taking those little actions. We don't have a firms phase. Firms is the advanced game. We're not doing that. Hiring is fulfilling vacant offices. It's the beginning of the game. It's none of that. Then we go to the chairman who then takes out all that debt. So you can't buy shares in the first round because there's no debt to reduce. It would be a waste of money. You should wait. He's assigned all the money. We then go to the director of trade. The director of trade spends his money to try to open these closed trading points. Now, to trade somewhere, you need to roll successfully and you can fulfill as many orders that are connected, that are open, equal to the amount of ships in the corresponding sea zone. So currently we only have one, one, and one, but we have a couple of unbuilt ships, so we'll be able to put out more and that will enable us to do that. If we build them all up here, hey, we've got six, five, and then maybe a four pounder that we could take um, that's a lot of money. We've got three and a four here, we've got a five, but nothing else. 
So what we can do is we can spend this three pounds as the director of trade to try to open up this. If we try to open up this um, and we roll successfully, um, this will go away and then we could fulfill more orders down here. Um, and again, you will get money for commissions based on writers or as the president of Madras, you might try to line the pockets of the director of trade. Hey, open this one and not this one because this one will help this guy, whereas opening this will help me, right? Lots of this back and forth, but you're gonna spend your three pounds at a one-to-one -one ratio to get dice to roll. And most of the time, you are trying to roll low in this game. Um, so we're just gonna roll the three dice in this one, and you need a one or a two on any one of the dice to succeed. And let's say uh, we're gonna try to open this one here. So you roll the dice, and I rolled a singular two, that's all you need, this goes away, we can trade in that space now. If I had rolled this, I rolled no ones or twos, that would be a failure, nothing would happen. If you roll only fives and sixes, that is a catastrophic failure, um, you are fired as the director of trade, uh, that's not good. <laughs> We'll talk about why that's not good a little bit later on. But that's, the director of trade is trying to open up areas. That's effectively what they're trying to do. And then we're going to move on to the manager of shipping. The manager of shipping is going to rearrange and purchase new ships. So uh, they're going to fit ships. Oh, the director of trade is going to move the ships. That's what they're doing. Um, the director of trade can move ships around that are already built. If you want to kind of stack an area because you've got lots of open ones, that they can move two of those around. Uh, but in this instance, we won't do that. But the manager of shipping can fit new ships, the blue ones, at three pounds a piece. Or they could buy the, they could lease these black ships. They're cheaper, but they only last one turn and then they go away. It's not good. And you will make uh, very fast enemies with the shipyard owners if you do that. Um, you can buy these permanent company ships. They're extremely expensive, but you can only do that if there are no um, blue ships available to be built. Uh, and the thing with the manager of shipping is that they have to spend down to two pounds or less. Um, in this instance, we've got two ships that can be built. So we'll spend five, six pounds to build the ships. So that's three apiece. And we've got these two ships that Purple owns. And we're going to put at least one up here because this is very lucrative. This is more lucrative than this, so we'll put another one down here. But then the president of Bombay might be like, hey, put them over here. I'll give you a pound to put them over here because the president of Bombay will make more money on commission if they can fulfill more orders. But ships are a limiting faction to orders. If multiple people have different ships to build and there's not enough money to go around, you might say, hey, let me give you a pound to build my ship instead of my opponent's because a built ship gives you one pound in the revenue phase. Um, long term, that's going to be good. Um, or you might give up something that isn't a pound to do it. Uh, so again, everything up for negotiation. But that's the manager of shipping. They're building the ships. They control a lot of that. Um, if you have three pounds, you have to spend that last three pounds so you would lease a ship. Um, but it, it, that's an interesting limiting factor. You can't be a total curmudgeon because otherwise the game kind of falls apart if there's no ships. Then we move on to the director of military affairs, which is purple. So military affairs, what they can do is they can transfer any two pieces and that's either officers or armies. So in each of these larger armies, we have a, a, a regular regiment, here's a regiment, here's a regiment. We don't have any officers, these are the officers. Uh, the officers will be assigned later. But if you needed to kind of stack an area, you could move them around. Later on in the game, you'll have a lot more assets to play around with. Uh, so we're not gonna move anyone around. What we will do is that we're going to then assign officers in training um, to the various commands. And then <laughs> we're gonna assign the commanders. So remember we put a bunch of money in Bengal and so we want to put a lot of our officers into Bengal uh, because each officer and each army that we commit will give us um, dice. So we're going to put in one, we're going to put in two, we're going to put a one up here as well and one up here so that way we've got strong-ish armies everywhere. 
but Bengal's got it. It's nice to play with, and we've got some money to invest in these kind of local temporary um, sepoys that we can get. For, the next thing that we do is we appoint a commander. Well, we already have a commander, you say. Well, there's more junior officers from this family than there is the commander, and so they conspire against them to fill this slot. <laughs> uh, so if you build lots of junior officers, you can command those armies. Um, and you can really hose people. That's important because when the loot is divided up, it's round robin, starting with the commander. So it's more likely the commander's gonna get more money than everyone else. Uh, so that's, that's the way that that works. Uh, what we're gonna then do is move on to the presidency of Bombay. And this is where we really get into kind of the, the meat and the fulfilling of the game. Because right now, the company has no money. We spent it all, it's all here. In our, in our different treasuries. So we're gonna spend this money now. So we've got five, six, seven, eight pounds to spend in Bombay. We have only one ship, and we have this kind of piddly little army. So we're not gonna take any crazy risks here. We're gonna spend four pounds. So I'll get rid of the five and get a one back so that we have some money for next turn. And I'm gonna roll dice equal to the money that I spent. So I'm gonna roll four dice. Once again, Need a one or a two. And that one or a two, I got the one. Thank goodness, you only need the one. And what we can do is we can fulfill one order in Bombay because we have one ship in Bombay. That's a bit sad early on in the game, but that's what it is. Now, the gray president of Bombay has to assign one of these two writers to fulfill that order. That writer will get a commission of one pound. So. Hey, pick my guy. I want the pound, please. Well, <laughs> what are you going to give me to pick your guy? And you might give them one of those promissory notes, or you might do something, or you might just say, no one cares. Just flip a coin. Who cares? Um, so we're going to pick blue to go in there. And we would pick blue in this instance because there's a lot of green guys here in the army, and if any military campaigns go off, um, there's, <laughs> there's a lot of money to be had, and we don't want to overload someone with cash. So we're going to put blue in there. We fulfilled one order. That order is worth four pounds. So we go one, two, three, four on the, on the money track at the bottom uh, of the board. And then we're going to give one pound commission to the blue player. Great. And the president of Bombay is going to get one pound for every order that is filled. So if you can get lots of boats and fill lots of orders, the presidency can be very lucrative. So the president is gray, they're also gonna get one pound. Uh, at this point, we have to give it over to the army of Bombay to uh, basically give it a go. Um, we can <clears throat> assign them some money to buy uh, some of these sepoys if we wanted, but to do a military conquest here is a little bit challenging because we don't have many assets and it would leave us um, quite weak in defense. So I'll talk about that when we get to Bengal, but we're basically just gonna give it over to the commander of the army of Bombay and we're not gonna allow them to buy any of this, at which point they're gonna say it's not worth it. It's more likely that they'll die. So we'll just kind of move on to the presidency of Madras. Madras is gonna do a similar thing to Bombay. We don't have all the money in the world, but we're gonna spend it to, um, fulfill orders. We've got two boats, we can fulfill two orders here. So we're gonna spend all five of the pounds that were allotted, because that way there's a, a little bit less room for error. And we're gonna pick up, hopefully, some good money. And again, we're just gonna roll the dice, looking for a one or a two. And I rolled lots of ones and twos, that's wonderful. So in Madras, we have these two orders that we can fill because we've got two boats. So we're gonna put out two of our writers, and we have three here, so do I wanna be very generous to Gray, who just picked up a money from here, or do I wanna spread the wealth? All of this is up for debate and negotiation. Knowing that Gray is probably gonna pick up a lot of money here, I might divide that up. So we're gonna pick up five and four is nine pounds, and we're gonna put these guys out here, because we've got two boats, we can fulfill two orders but the company gets nine pounds. So we're gonna to go to 13 pounds altogether. Uh, and yellow's gonna get one pound commission. Gray is gonna get one pound commission. 
and the president of Madras filled two orders, so the president of Madras Blue is going to get two pounds. Wonderful, we like to see that happening. Um, great. Again, they're going to throw it over to the army. Well, the army's not going to do anything this turn, uh, because they're just, again, very weak, and it's not, we haven't invested there quite yet. So we're going to move over to the presidency of Bengal, where we do have a lot of money to play with. And this is where things will start to get very interesting in how we uh, apportion things. So the first thing that we're going to do is um, we're just going to try to trade, uh, because we've only got two boats, we can only fulfill these two orders. We'll just do it and kind of get it over with. So we're going to spend five pounds again, and the five pounds is going to give us five dice. We really want to trade. We need money in the company, otherwise the company is going to sink. So we roll our five dice. Wow, I rolled only ones and twos. That's incredible. Someone write that down for posterity. That'll never happen again. Uh, what that means is that I could put out two writers because I've got two ships. I can fulfill two orders. Uh, and in this instance, mm, as the pink player, I could just put myself out and get that money. Or I could try to appear to be being generous, even though I have a lot of power and shares in the company, and put everyone else out. Um, so, you, you know, you can be as cutthroat as you want. We're going to put out these two guys. That's going to give us 11 more pounds. So we're going to go up to 24 pounds. And you might say, we've only got 24 pounds and we spent 25. Yes, I agree with you. <laughs> we'll get there. Um, at this point, um, green's going to get one pound. Yellow's going to get one pound. And pink, the president of Bengal, is going to get two pounds. So that's the trading part. Then we're going to hand it over to the army of Bengal. And we've got a couple of assets here, uh, but we also have a lot of money that we can spend on getting these irregulars, or the, these kind of local set boys. So, we could spend six pounds. So I've got five, six... This one costs four pounds, this one costs one pound, and that gives us two dice, and that gives us one. So we're going to buy these guys, and we'll put them all up in the army here. And what we're going to then do is we're going to exhaust our assets to commit them to battle. So currently I've got one, two, three, four, five, six potential dice that I could roll, if I rolled every single one of them. However, you subtract from that the strength, which is one, of the local kind of uh, military and infrastructure. This is a two, and uh, the stacks can get very big very quickly. <laughs> so, I'm gonna, if I committed to everything, I'm gonna roll five dice. Why would you not do that, you might ask? Well, you might not do that because everyone that you commit goes down in this little committed box. And then if you get attacked back, you have a zero strength for defense. So we're going to leave a guy behind just in case. Or we might, yeah, we're going to leave a guy behind <laughs> just to have one guy in defense, just in case. So we've got one, two, three, four, five, minus one is four. We're gonna roll four dice. And once again, we are going to constantly look at our little chart. If we roll four D6, we've got an 80% chance of success. That's pretty good. I think most people would take that. So let's roll. And what we're trying to do here is we're trying to get a one or a two. And I rolled the two, but boy, was it close. <laughs> uh, so we had a successful military campaign. Well, what does that mean? It means a few things, and we're going to go into this kind of little sub-phase. So, the local army is destroyed. We'll put that back in the box for now. I almost guarantee that it will come back. We are going to, in place of that, place this little red space, and what that means is, if you look, the shape is perfect for one of our playing pieces. It now means that this is company-controlled region, and we need to elect a governor. Uh, so, we're going to go to our little deck of cards, and we need the governorship of Bengal. So we have the governor of Bengal, and they have their own little set of powers. It goes into the vacant offices. During next year's hiring phase, we will hire a new governor. 
and the governor will be appointed by the president of Bengal. So just remember how many writers that we've got down here might make you eligible for that. So it does that. And then what it's gonna do is gonna divide up some loot. Um, so you get um, the, you get four gold plus the strength of the army that was there, which is one, so we get five, plus as a one-time bonus, this six. Um, this six then goes into the presidency of Bengal to show that, that it is controlled by this presidency. Once this army conquests this one, the Maratha one will go in there, just so that we can apportion who controls what, basically, and who assigns what. Um, so we're going to divide up a total of 11 loot, and we're going to divide it up between everyone who was in the fight. So there's five pieces, and this is why it's important to apportion these uh, appropriately, and who goes where and what and in what order. But basically we're going to go 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11. So he's going to get three and he's going to get two. So we're going to give Grey five gold for their military conquest immediately. That is very powerful. Green's going to get two. So Green's going to pick up two. And then the four that were assigned to these guys, it's kind of wasted. There just is nothing. It's just a detractor from the amount that you can possibly get. But all of these guys are exhausted for now. Before we do that, though, I probably should have said, we're going to roll to see if everyone died in combat. Uh, everyone rolls a d6 on a 6, you die in combat. So the commander goes first. Oh no, he died. Uh, the grey guy survived and the green guy survived. Okay, that's actually significant and we will change that. Uh, it's very important to do that first and I always forget to do it. So he dies. Great. So he dies, he goes back into the pool of people we have available. Because now that 11 gold gets split differently. We don't have a commander, we go 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11. So three, three, and the rest is wasted. So that looks very different from the five and the two that the gray player had got. So that's why you always roll the attrition rolls and I always forget them. So if you play with me, please remind me to do that if you do military conquests. But that can be very, very, very lucrative. The problem is, is that our guy died, which isn't great. Um, if they survive and you, you're successful, you're gonna get one of these nice little trophy markers uh, which a trophy gives you one uh, power. Remember, power can translate into some victory points at the end of the game. So had he survived, little Grey's getting his little trophy and he's going to gain some power from that. If you do lots and lots of conquesting and lots of success in battle, you can gain a lot of power that way. Um, but that's, that's the, why you would... You, when you detract the amount of military there is from your power, these little two guys with no money to buy the the locals, it's not worth doing it because failure can be very bad. Um, so don't do that. Uh, so we traded, we did a little military conquest, then we're gonna move on. Uh, we don't have a China phase because we haven't opened the opium trade to China. Although now we've taken Bengal and we have these opium symbols, we could try that next time. Then we go to bonuses. Uh, you get a bonus for every ship you've built, you get one pound. So everyone, this guy, purple has three ships, they're gonna get one pound, three pounds. Pound, pound for people who own all the ships. And you might have some other bonuses that you're gonna pick up on then. Then we're gonna spend our beloved revenue on upkeep and paying dividends. So the upkeep of the company can get very expensive very quickly. So what we need to do is we need to pay for uh, the upkeep of our, um, of all, basically all of our stuff. Uh, so let me just double check. I'm pretty sure you have to pay for your junior officers. I know there's always something that I have to look up. Regiment and officer and each, yes, okay, good. It is the officers, I always have to check. So you have to pay one for every ship, one for every officer, and one for every um, army, and one for every point of debt that you have. So we have to pay one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15. So we have our sweet, sweet 24, and this is gonna go all the way down to nine. So that's not good. Uh, we needed to get more money than that. So this is where more people should have built ships, or we could have tried more risky trades, or put things here and tried to get some more of these expensive ones. You know, things like that. 
but you know, that's kind of where we're at. So what we're going to do now is we are going to pay for our dividends. So the chairman at his leisure can pay dividends and they can only pay dividends if they can pay them equally. So we could do one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. We have nine. We could pay one to everyone. Pink's going to pick up four. So that could be very lucrative. However, that, mixes all of our money and it's not for it's you know we're not gonna have much money going forward because we cannot if we look at the company standing pay the expected 10 pounds that the public expects us to have made we actually go down in standing so we're one step closer to the company failing so after you pay your expenses you need to have this amount of money to be able to pay dividends otherwise your company standing goes down if you have more than that it goes up However, you don't have to pay the dividends. You just have to have the money to be able to. Uh, so uh, a, a ruthless chairman would pay himself lots of money there. A charitable or a good chairman, depending on your opinion on that, might save that money so that we have more money going forwards if people invest shares into the company. Um, because our standing went down and we didn't have a lot of money, I regularly recommend that first turn to not pay out dividends so that you have lots of money going forward and you can do a lot more because we'll have um, more money, more governorships, this is more open, we can do more things if we build more ships. You have to spend money to make money. Uh, then we're going to go to the events in India phase which is the part that trips people up the most. Uh, so the events in India phase uses this little circular deck which we will get to. The first thing we're going to do is we're going to roll the cursed die. And the cursed die has a number of things on it, and we'll kind of go through those. Perfect. We rolled two. So we're going to do two events, and we're going to do E with a storm. So there is a storm in the eastern sea zone, and that means that each of those ships has to roll, otherwise it might be damaged or destroyed. Some of them times you get four events with no storms. Sometimes you get one event, but with a storm in every space, which can get very expensive very, very quickly. But two and one in the east, that's not terrible. Uh, so let's roll for each of these ships. Uh, a one or a two, they're fine. A four or a five, they're damaged, which means they're flipped over. Or a five or a six, they are destroyed. So let's do the Thistleworth first. We're just going to roll a die. I rolled a six. Of course I did. This ship is destroyed. So it goes back onto the shipyard. And this has to be rebuilt by the manager of shipping. Then we're going to do the Lady Flora. I rolled a three, it's damaged. A damaged ship just means it's one step closer to being destroyed at the next storm. Still functions perfectly fine, do anything. Uh, so it's still just a regular old ship. Then we're gonna resolve some events in India. Um, typically this is also gonna refer to this elephant. And there is a play aid chart as well, which can seem very esoteric, but we will go through this and hopefully this is helpful to people. Uh, so you're going to flip over just one card and do what it says. So we are going to resolve a crisis with the elephant having a plus zero modifier. So what that means is, is you can refer to this crisis table and you're going to implement what it is that the elephant is trying to do. And we talked about this a little bit earlier, but basically the Maratha region is trying to rebel against its uh, kind of parent Delhi and it's going to do that at a plus zero. So this is a two strength and this is a one strength um, and they would get support from their ally, uh, the other part of the confederacy Punjab, but that's a zero. So it's a two to a one. There's no modifiers to that. The modifiers come from the cards. This can be like plus three. Like you can get some real nasty stuff going on. Uh, and as such, uh, the, this, the attack is successful because the attacker is higher than the defender and what's going to happen is, is we're going to remove their flag and they're going to close all of their orders as they rebel. So this is going to go away as they become an independent state, but as they become an independent state, they close their doors and we have to go and do diplomacy with them. So all of these are going to close. So, you know, maybe next time we were going to stack all our ships here and try to go in here. Well, now we have to open these orders to be able to do that first. Um, and uh, now that we've done that, the elephant is going to march. This is part of this. Uh, if it's done Imperial Ambitions, 
you're going to do the imperial ambitions phase of things. So what's going to happen is, and it's once again, it's all on here. Uh, if it is sovereign, because the capital doesn't have a flag, it doesn't have a flag, it's a little sovereign nation now, they were going to place the elephant on the border matching the symbol facing away from itself. Uh, so what we're going to look at is we have this little triangle symbol, and so it is going to sit upon the triangle symbol, which is very, very, very tiny, printed on the board, facing away from itself. So it became an independent nation, but they're going to try to invade Bengal, <laughs> undo everything we did, and expand their empire. If they do, they're going to become a different colored flag, and then they're going to put a little one on here if they can kick us out, which would be very bad. We don't want that. That would be extremely not good. Um, but that's why, you know, this is going to happen now. Remember, we rolled two events. We're going to roll a second event, and they might do this right this second, which is why we left the little guy in defense, just in case. Uh, so that's what's going to happen there. Uh, so we'll, get, we'll kind of set that aside. The next event is going to be a leader. So what's going to happen is, is that this little sovereign nation is going to gain a leader. They're going to get plus one strength if sovereign. They are sovereign because they're a little independent. So they become a three, which is even more terrifying going forward. Um, if they were not sovereign, there would be a rebellion in that area if they were dominated. Um, but that's it. Um, that's all that happens in there. Nothing else will happen. Um, so that's the events. That's all that happens in those events. Um, figuring this out, m once you do it a few times, it will start to make sense. But this is a significant threat um, and not good. Um, we need to kind of deal with this. Either having a strong army or marching in here and defeating this massive stack. But again, we'll have to commit a lot of money to that. Maybe we'll move some of the assets from Madras and Bombay down there so we've got more guys. You know, all the stuff that you'd expect. But that's the events in India. And then we go on to the Parliament Meets phase, where the Prime Minister, who has this Prime Ministerial dial, they are going to draw a card from this law deck. And they're simply going to draw a card and keep it secret and look at it for themselves. And what they're going to do is they're going to read it. All loot is now added to the company balance. That is wildly strong. I've never seen that before. So all that loot, the 11 loot that we got from dominating Bengal, that would go into the company coffers instead of being divided up between the army. Uh, so <laughs> that is unconscionably strong. But the people who are in the army and invested in that are going to very heavily vote against that. Um, so th lots of stuff to consider here. So the prime minister is going to read this secretly to themselves. What they can do is, if they don't like that, they can draw another one, and then they can choose between these two. If they don't like either of those, they could draw another one and choose between those three. And you stop at three. However, that's a little push-your-luck mechanic, because if you draw one of these dilemmas, you discard all the rest of these, and you do the dilemma, and the dilemmas are all bad. You do not want to do that. Uh, so, yeah, not great. Uh, but we'll, we'll, we'll stick with this one because this is interesting and it would be very polarizing at a table. A lot of people will be up in arms about this, especially gray and green. Um, and hopefully they don't have lots of power to vote with. <laughs> so to fund this treasury reform, um, what we're going to do is we're going to move our policy marker, which is this arm, to either side to the nearest um, tax, to, to the nearest shares symbol. So we're going to either move it, uh, immediately stop at the symbol, which means we would have to tax the shareholders to do it. Or we could go the other way, and we're going to go all the way around to the next share symbol, which is bonus. That's great. What that's going to do is that's going to give, um, it's going to pay out to all of the people who have um, a share. So if the prime minister, who the prime minister currently is, um, Who's the, who's the PM? Uh, is it Yella? I don't remember who I made as the PM. I think it was Yella, right? Yes, I'm pretty sure it was Yella. If Yella's trying to curry favor with Pink, they might say, hey man, I'll give you 
you know, I'll pay out these four pounds to you if you let this, if you help get this passed. Or they might say, Sod Pink, we're going to tax, effectively taxing Pink four pounds to get this done. But then, you know, people have to agree or not agree on it. And then what you're going to do, once you've set your policy and then you read this aloud to everyone and discuss it, um, this is not a particularly favorable policy. This starts at minus three. One, two, three. If it's positive, it will pass, uh, and this law will go into effect. If it is negative, it will fail, uh, and it won't go into effect. It'll just be discarded. So what we're going to do is we're going to, starting with the Prime Minister, vote. And you are going to vote with the votes from your enterprises. So a shipyard gives you one vote, which is nice. But a workshop gives you two votes. That can be very, very, very strong. Uh, what you might have eventually is some of these London season cards give you lots of votes if you're voting on a shares-based policy, which we are. So some of these can be very, 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 very powerful. The other thing you can vote with, of course, is money. So hopefully, grey and green don't have a ton of money that they're willing to sink into this. Well, as it turns out, based on all those military conquestings and lootings that they did, Grey, green has a lot of money. This can buy you a lot of votes. And that's just the green player. And the grey player has even more money. Um, so it, it could be... That you can start losing battles and you might not want to do that. So you kind of assess what everyone's got, where everyone's at money-wise before you set those policies, or try to overrule people. But starting with the Prime Minister, they're going to commit their votes and any money that they have, and you're going to go around the table committing votes or abstaining. And once it gets back to the Prime Minister, they can either say, yep, we're done, that's great, or they can go for another round where people can throw more money in, depending on where the results are at that point. And so this marker is going to go back and forth, back and forth. It might tank totally and be down here, at which point everyone kind of gives up, or it might be kind of in the middle and you're like, you know what? I was going to spend my money later, but I'll do it now because I really want this to happen because it'll help the company succeed and it stops the warmongering. Or, the, or the, the military guys might be like, absolutely not, and they're trying to tank this thing. Uh, so let's say that it fails because I think that's more interesting in this particular case for teaching because if it fails, the person who spent the most money or had the most votes, a combination of money and, uh, and enterprises, they will, if it fails, become the leader of the opposition, and the leader of the opposition, if it fails, will become the new prime minister. And so this will literally get handed to that player. They're elected as a new prime minister because the old one was ineffective. They now have the two power, and they are going to read the laws, and they're going to decide what gets voted on next time. All that kind of goodness. So that will get passed around. However, if the prime minister had got it to pass, just like a war trophy, they're going to get a past law power, which again can translate into victory points at the end of the game. So th the laws are very interesting. You will see a lot of them, and they will do all sorts of different things that, depending situationally, can be absolutely incredible. They, everyone can benefit from them, or most people, or some people are going to get shafted, and you just kind of have to take your lumps, but that might sour you against that prime minister or it might sour you against the company, at which point, instead of trying to do all of this, you're going to invest in those workshops, and you're going to put the ships where they're not needed, or you're going to rearrange the army assets if you're the military affairs guy, so they're in a useless place where we don't need them. Um, you might purposefully not make roles that are needed, at which point people are going to try to oust you from those roles. Lots and lots of different things like that. But well, that's Parliament Meets, and then we go to upkeep and refresh. Um, there's no upkeep at the moment because we don't have anyone retired, uh, but refresh, we're basically going to uh, move all these guys back up, get rid of these guys, everyone puts their writers back, so these guys are going to go back to Madras, just kind of clean up everything, reset everything, um, and then we move on. We go all the way around to the other side of the board, and we're going to do the London season phase, which is the last thing to happen but it's also kind of the first thing to happen. So, the London season phase, nothing happens in the first turn because there isn't one. First we do attrition, then we do retirement, and then we get these prestige cards. 
So what happens in this phase is that every single person who is an office holder, outside of the commanders of the armies, they're not office holders, so everyone who has one of these kind of cards, they are going to roll a d6 to see if they retire. And this is the only roll in the game where you typically want to roll high, um, because you want guys to retire if you have money. If you have money, you want to roll high. If you don't have money, maybe you want to roll low to keep yourself in power. So we'll start with the chairman, and the chairman's a stressful job, so he has a natural plus one. Uh, it's, it's written on his card uh, as well uh, to do that. And so he's going to roll the die, and he rolled a one, plus one is a two, one or a two, nothing happens. So he's going to stay in power, good for him. Then the director of trade's going to roll, he rolled a four or five. So a four or five means that you neither retire, nor do you not retire, but it's wearing on you. So the, man, the director of trade, who's Mr. Blue over here, uh, he gets one of these tired cubes. Oh, he's tired. And what that means is that he gets a plus one modifier next time. So he's more likely to retire next time. Manager of shipping, rolls a one. Military affairs, rolls a one. Good gracious, no one's retiring. Bombay, Madras. Hey, Madras is gone. So Madras is going to retire. Beep, beep. And then the president of Bengal, is also fine. Wow, that's incredible. I've never seen anything like that. Um, that's a boring example, I think. Who's blue? Yeah, we're going to retire someone. So let's say, uh, oh, Green doesn't have anyone to retire, of course. Uh, let's say this guy retired as well. Uh, so th those two guys retire. When you retire, you uh, take your, um, where they retired from. So we had Presidency of Bombay and Madras. Those go back in here, and these are going to be dealt out during the hiring phase again. And gray was the presidency of Bombay, so those will be uh, those will be assigned later on. Now, what you're going to do is all the pensioners are going to uh, spend money to go to these stately homes and get victory points. So gray has a lot of money. So right off the bat, they're going to spend eight pounds. So we've got five, six, seven, eight. They're going to spend all of that, and they're going to retire their guy over to this. Eight pound stately home. Wonderful. They're going to get four victory points for that. Go up to four. Blue doesn't have quite so much money. They only have four pounds. Oh, they have five, sorry. Uh, so they could spend almost all their money to get two victory points. Or they could just spend two pounds, not get any victory points, but because they retired someone, they get access to these. Um, because they don't have very much money, they're just going to spend the two pounds to go to kind of this generic house that's not that great. So now what we do is, whoever spent the most money in this phase gets first choice of these. So uh, what's going to happen is, they're going to look through these and they can secretly look at this blackmail card, because it's a different shade and it's a, one of these blackmail cards. Um, they could keep it, which no one else would see what it is. Or they could buy one of these spouses. Uh, so this one gives you two victory points, which is nice. Uh, but uh, and it's negative one pounds for upkeep, or negative one pounds to retire. Sorry, purple is retiring. So it makes it cheaper to retire guys in the future. But you may no longer enlist officers as your family action. So Mr. Gray, who already has a bunch of officers, that might not be the worst thing, because we can never do placing officers here to go into the army ever again. So they might say, yeah, I'll, Mr. Gray, I'll take this. I'll get two victory points. One, two. Uh, and it's cheaper to retire guys as well, but I lock myself out of military affairs for the future. Even though I've got a couple guys there, that's not terrible. Then the person who spent the next most gets to choose between these two. They can have a secret look at the blackmail card, or they could choose the little spouse. Now, we didn't get any victory points from retiring, so we're going to probably pick up this one, maybe get some victory points. One, one, two, three, so we've got five. It's cheaper to retire guys by two pounds, but you can only go to the 8 or 12 victory point spaces, which are these very, very expensive ones. So again, that's a commitment to retiring guys up here or finding victory points elsewhere if I can't get the money. And you have to assess, right? I've got a guy here, he's not making any money, she's making a little bit of money, I'm getting something from shares if we pay dividends. Blue doesn't have a lot of avenues for income currently, so if they choose this in the future, they might put out a bunch of writers, or they might put out a bunch of army guys to try doing that loot. But hopefully that loot law didn't pass where the money goes to the government, or it goes to the company instead of myself. Right, so there's all these knock-on effects of all that stuff. 
Uh, this gets discarded, and then we're going to put out three more for next time. And next time's ones come with these windows and some power. And you might ask, what are the windows? Well, the windows find themselves on luxury items. They find themselves on these estates of varying amounts and on some of these cards. Um, and that's because some of these, you have to do a window tax. And when you have to do a window tax, you got to pay window tax for however many windows you have. So if you've got one, two, three, four, if they're leveraging window tax, your retirements that drain your money in upkeep anyway get very expensive if you get taxed on those as well. So hopefully you have friends in high places where you can avoid those taxes and encourage them to not levy those. Uh, but that's the, all that. And then we go back to the family phase on turn two. And we're going to take our little family actions. And the family actions were again placing out new guys, buying shares, buying workshops. However, whichever one that you did, if you do that again, you can do it twice. So if you start switching them around, you're only going to do the one thing. This is where buying shares becomes very important. Uh, first, you want to dilute down Pink's power on the board of directors. That's not great. <laughs> but if you can spend your money, so let's say Green is like, yeah, I'm going to buy a share. I'm going to buy a share for four pounds because I want to guarantee that it goes through. You take one of your little green guys and he goes on the four pound space. And, and every share that you buy moves the company debt down more. And so if someone else might say, oh, I'm going to buy a three pound share. Let's say Yellow's going to spend their last three pounds and buy a three pound share. Great, buy a little three pound share. This goes down one again. So that investment in the company, these people lose that money, but it means we can take out more money on top of our nine pounds that we have. Uh, but then at the end of the family phase, we're going to become shareholders. So now I'm going to pick up victory points at the end of the game. I'm also going to get payouts if we do dividends, but there's more people to pay dividends to, so we need to make more money. Uh, but we can take out more debt now that we've reduced it with those shares. And let's say you take the share action. Well, next time you might be able to buy two shares. Yeah, it costs money, but you can take that action twice. And all of a sudden, you've got four guys on the board and you can really leverage power because once the chairman retires, it's a board decision. You just have to get a majority of people to agree with you. And so if you've got four yellow ones and there's like, you know, three pink ones, you can just say, hey, Mr. Pink, uh, you let me be it. I'll give you some money, great. And you wheel and deal and it's all that kind of stuff. Uh, after you've done all your family stuff, you're gonna to go to hiring. And that's the last thing that we'll do here is that you're gonna divvy out all of these new things in numerical order. So the president of Bombay is chosen by the director of trade. So not only does the director of trade have to um, open these areas, they get to assign a lot of these things. They have a lot of power in that way. Um, the candidates can be writers and governors associated with the presidency. So the president of Bombay has to be chosen from, let's put these guys back, has to be chosen from one of these two writers, or if Bombay had a governor, it does not, um, it could be from them as well. What's interesting here is the director of trade has a guy who he could promote, and you could do that if, uh, if you can get everyone to agree, because nepotism is only allowed in this game, and this would be considered nepotism, that's only allowed if every other viable candidate agrees to allow it to happen. And that's where things like um, your promissory notes become very, very strong. Because if Blue had seen maybe something like this coming, because they're the director of trade and they could do this, they might have acquired through wheeling and dealing Green's consent for nepotism. <laughs> and if you have Green's consent for nepotism, you can say, screw you, I'm gonna make myself the president of Bombay, ha ha. Or if they don't have or can't get the consent for nepotism, they have to put Green in. Um, so you, can't, you can't just serve yourself, you have to pay to be able to help yourself or get those promissory notes from wheeling and dealing. Uh, but that's, you know, then that person becomes the president of Bombay, so we give that to Green. The director of trade is going to choose the president of Madras, and it's the same thing. They're going to choose from one of these writers or a Madras governor if they're not. 
And so, hey, green and yellow, what are you going to offer me to become the president? Because there's lots of money to be had. You get two money instead of one for being a writer. All that kind of stuff. You get to control the purse strings. You get to assign money to the army. All the good stuff. Lots of power. But more importantly than all that is that the these guys have the option or the potential to retire. And that's how you're going to pick up your victory points. If you don't have anyone to retire, it's hard to pick up these huge victory point amounts, especially later in the game. Uh, and the last one is the governor of Bengal, which is chosen by the president of Bengal, and it is from uh, writers and officers within this presidency. So you can choose any one of these three or any one of these two. So you can go through any of these, but again, pink can't choose pink unless green, yellow, and gray agree. Um, so it's unlikely with lots and lots of candidates you're going to be able to get yourself in there, but it's not impossible. And so, hey, Mr. Yellow, well, if, you, if I make you the president of Bengal, can you give me a pound? Can you promise to do this, that, or this? None of which is binding in any meaningful way, but you can, you can kind of offer those kinds of things. Or you might say, hey, man, Gray got a lot of money from all this military conquesting. I'm going to make them the governor so that they can't get money from conquesting further on. Um, but I'll make it... I'll, I won't bring that up. I'll make it look like I'm being generous so that they don't become a very bad governor, tax the place to hell, create a bunch of unrest, and then we end up with a rebellion. But that's... You know, you assign all those, and then you just go through it again and again, and, and the company will make a lot of money, and then you might pay out dividends, and then you kind of start that process again. We're going to buy more shares, we're going to invest in the company. And it goes again and again, but every single step, at every single point is up for negotiation, which accounts for the length of the game. It's about an hour a turn, honestly. Maybe slightly less with experienced players, because once you can value certain things after a few plays, it's like, this isn't worth arguing over, I don't care. Or you can assess your situation, you can bend someone to your will, where you're like, hey, if you don't do this, I will absolutely ruin everyone. But you out yourself as like a tool in that instance, and no one's going to trust you going forward. So how much do you want to leverage that kind of stuff? But hopefully that was at least somewhat helpful. It's easy when you're playing it because you see it again and again and again, but that was hopefully uh, some use to you and why I love this game so much. So appreciate you very much for tuning in. I've been Alexander from theplayersaid.com.